Okay, so yesterday um, I gave you a brief overview of the background of ecological networks, tried to introduce you to some uh, key ideas in the fields. Uh, so uh, in some ways yesterday we began drawing the map of ecological networks and now we're going to look at some points of interest on that map. Um, and by that I mean some contemporary topics that have really uh, shaped the field more recently. Um, and we're going to take uh, a look at some familiar concepts. So familiar to those of you that have studied complex networks before. So things like motifs and modularity, apply them to ecology. And then I'll also try and introduce um, some less common um, methods and approaches such as intervality, structural stability and nestedness, which you might not have met before, but are uh, relatively common in the field of ecological networks. Before I get into uh, motifs and uh, modularity and those other things, I'd like to give you a brief um, introduction into today's uh, lecture. So yesterday we really focused on the relationship between structure and function, and we focused on uh, stability and these local stability analysis from the perspective of Robert May's work, and then robustness, meaning uh, cascading secondary extinctions analysis, so in this uh, figure of the relationship between structural dynamics and function, we really looked at in very broad terms at this uh, relationship. And then today I really wanna focus in on how researchers have studied the structure of ecological networks. And then right at the very end to lead into the practical, I wanna give you some information on how <laughs> ecologists have tried to study this pathway of relating network structure so dynamics of our network structure is changing onto uh, assessing the function of an ecological community. I'm going to begin with the idea of motifs, which any of you who have studied complex networks should be familiar with this idea. Uh, they are sort of the idea, general idea is zooming in on particular patterns of nodes and then seeing how prevalent they are throughout the entire uh, network. Uh, the motivation for studying motifs in ecology actually stems from Robert May's work on local stability analysis. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, decades of work following his 1972 paper, where he showed um, from a mathematical random matrix theory perspective, that the more complex a community is, the more species and interactions that are part of that community, the less stable they were. And yesterday we talked about all of the uh, important assumptions underlying that claim, uh, but regardless of how unrealistic those assumptions are in the sort of real world, um, it really became an obsession of ecologists to try and understand how this very nice mathematical result that said that more complex communities are going to be less stable, how they could reconcile that result with their experience of the vast biodiversity seen on this planet. And that was one of the big problems that preoccupied ecologists from the 70s through to the early 2000s, was really trying to understand what are the ways that real ecological communities are structured? What are the relevant processes that enable them to exist with large numbers of species, large numbers of interactions, despite the fact that it's meant those, are, those kinds of communities are not really meant to exist, or they are meant to be more difficult to exist. So one of the approaches that ecologists took was to look at motifs within ecological communities and motifs that were motivated by well-understood ecological processes. So it's probably easiest to look at a few examples. So these are three species motifs. Uh, so these are nodes. Each node is a species. Then you have an interaction. Uh, these are trophic interactions, feeding interactions, a predator eating a prey. And one of the first applications of motifs was to translate some ecological processes like omnivory, so a consumer that feeds at two different trophic levels. Uh, so here you might have um, a predator that feeds both on plants and then other animals, uh, looking at other ecological processes such as apparent competition. Um, so here is a predator, here are two preys, um, and these are the so-called measurable, observable interactions, feeding interactions, 
these two preys are in competition with one another in the sense that if the predator is focusing on one of its prey, it's less likely to focus on the other. So there is apparent competition between these two preys and so on. So ecologists began to translate ecological processes into motifs, and then they began to see First, to what extent do these motifs affect things like stability? So what is the relationship between omnivory and stability, between apparent competition and stability? And then take an empirical network that ask, are these particular motifs more or less common in a real empirical network than you would expect? So here's a graph uh, that shows um, for a variety of different motifs, to what extent they are more or less observed than you would expect compared to, say, a random graph, which is what May's work is largely built on. So this is, um, this work was particularly popular in the early 2000s, uh, which dovetailed with the emergence of motifs in complex networks more generally. They find large fallen out of favor in work that is currently taking place, largely because it's very computationally expensive to look at motifs beyond sort of three species. Um, and also making sense of motifs that include more than three species because there's so much overlap between uh, the various different patterns. So you can imagine you get something like omnivory with three species, what happens if you start adding in four or five species? Firstly, the number of different motif patterns is going to increase exponentially as you start including the motifs of more species. And then you also have different patterns nested within others. So this is something that really uh, was popular in the past, is become less popular now, although you still see work that involves motifs. So this is a paper I was involved in, uh, came out in 2021. Um, but now in order to use motifs and have it be successfully published, you really need to go beyond uh, just single networks. Uh, here we did a global analysis of competition networks in alpine plants across uh, different locations over the world. And then also look to understand the relationship between motifs and more realistic or relevant um, system functions. In this case, we looked at biodiversity rather than local stability analysis. Another area involving motifs uh, that I think is really exciting involves temporal motifs. So most of the work has uh, focused on sort of static networks where people have collected data over a relatively short period of time um, and looked for patterns that are unchanged motifs that don't change through time. Um, I can't show you any of the work because this is still in process, and this is not by me, but I've seen other people do this work. I've been reviewing papers that involve temporal motifs and people have discussed in the conferences. Uh, but I think this is a really interesting extension of motifs to looking at how uh, you can see small patterns in uh, small groups of species interactions changing through time as the most obvious extension to uh, motifs that I think are really promising. Any questions about motifs? No, I have a question on the empirical data that yeah. I collected. So uh, could you spend one word on how people collect these data? Then? Yeah, so I'm going to go into a bit more detail tomorrow about how data oh. are collected. Um, but uh, you can imagine um, there is observation. It's like the first thing that ecologists will use is particularly early on looking at, say, marine food webs. You would literally sit and you would try and observe what eats what. You might perform gut content analysis, which means you catch an individual, you cut it open, you would see what it's consumed. Um, for terrestrial systems, you might observe what's been eating what. You uh, can look at feces analyses to see what's been eaten. Uh, for the bipartite networks in particular, you have things like plant pollinator, where you can uh, walk along the brand sex, and then with a butterfly net, you can catch um, which pollinators land on which plants, identify them, and build the networks. Uh, in that way, uh, I mentioned host parasitoid networks yesterday. There, you can set out traps um, where the hosts lay their eggs, and then the parasitoids will infect the eggs. You collect the traps, you bring them back into the lab, and then you can rear them. 
Um, so it's really uh, a combination of either observation, where you can, particularly with larger size organisms, where you can very easily identify them, um, or you have the two-step process of collecting uh, samples and then identifying them after the fact. But to build networks, you really need to first define what kind of interaction you're focusing on, and then secondly, have a way of collecting individuals and then identifying them which if you have very small insects can be difficult because you need a large amount of expertise. So either you have that expertise in the field and can do it. So either the researcher has the expertise or you collect samples that then get, get sent to taxonomists for um, more authoritative identification. Does that help clarify a bit? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, with the um, say alpine plants, uh, plants are a bit easier because they don't move around. So you can go to a place, there are very formal techniques for sort of sampling a particular area, identifying the species, seeing how close they are to one another, and then assuming competition based on a typical radius for what they would potentially compete for resources within. So larger trees will have a larger radius of influence or surrounding species. Smaller plants, smaller radius. So with plants is like neighboring relations that find that by and large yeah okay. so you're are you competing for light so you might look at shade do some plants shade out other plants there's also competition for resources so root systems for example might be competition for water uh, but you also have uh, facilitative interactions uh, where it's a bit less of a physically obvious relationship, but some plants and nitrogen fixers uh, you know, help repair the soil for other plants. So it really is sort of a multi-step process of first defining, okay, what's the kind of network that you want to study? Um, how can you then collect that data, identify the species, and then draw your network? Um, but it's by and large a very time-consuming uh, process. Um, so a lot of work which I've been talking about is uh, how can you more effectively sample uh, species to build these networks? Thanks. What about the people? Uh, in what uh, sense? The social, uh, social city, mm -hmm. uh, if you have the only liberalistic system, is a very linear system. Do you have same motives so complex as uh, uh, other uh, species? If you have humans involved in the system, uh, well, that uh, that I'll talk a bit about tomorrow when we consider social ecological networks. So, is there a way of incorporating people into these networks? I think almost all of the work I'll be talking about today, so sort of the contemporary topics, um, are really the old school perspective of there is a natural system that is ideally untouched by humans and therefore can be studied objectively. Um, but I think ecologists are beginning to realize that there's a limit to how much you can understand from that, particularly if you're interested in addressing societal problems because there humans are intrinsically involved. So I think there's the move from you know, people fly out to the Amazon rainforest when it's pristine and you study a completely natural system to, okay, let's now study the impacts of human activities on how humans are changing an otherwise pristine system to, okay, humans are an inherent part of an environmental system, and therefore there are feedbacks between humans and the environment. I don't think you can actually generalize that argument because uh, oftentimes I think when ecologists go, go out and collect data on the network, they focus on a particular type of ecological interaction that they're interested in, yes. so host parasitoid networks or say plant interaction networks. And then they focus really on those types of ecological interaction with the species. But all, very often those are then embedded actually in a larger ecosystem. So plants may interact with bacteria in the soil and those will interact with each other and then there might be all kinds of other types of <laughs> that are not uh, taken into account. Yeah, you're exactly right. And then tomorrow I'll mention multi-layer networks and how ecologists are attempting to build networks that go beyond just the one or two particular sets of species, one particular kind of interaction to building in these other kinds of interaction, which is an interesting effort and um, is even more expensive in terms of cost and time and manpower to collect those data. Uh, and there's the question of, is it worth it? 
Um, that's still an open question in ecological networks, but people are trying and seeing what can happen. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to talk about that today. Today, I'm going to focus on sort of the traditional one or two groups of species, set of interactions that are well-defined, uh, usually one type of interaction, and then how the structure of that network has been analyzed. And then tomorrow we will go into a bit more detail about going beyond that, this current paradigm. Okay, so the second topic I wanna to talk about is uh, modularity. Uh, so if you've done uh, any work on complex networks before, you've probably come across uh, this term. This uh, is my favorite paper uh, that talks about um, modularity. Modularity is one method approach to understanding community detection. And communities uh, in a general network sense are thought to be groups of nodes that have more interactions among themselves and fewer interactions to nodes that belong to other communities. Uh, so in some ways, there's a, a sort of a circular argument involved here where you have a network and then you are trying to find communities based on the interaction pattern. Uh, in ecology, at least, often your starting network represents some kind of subset of a larger community already, um, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but if you are thinking of doing any kind of community detection, so searching for groups of highly interacting uh, nodes uh, within a large network, I really recommend this paper by Fortunato and Chris, uh, which is a long paper, but really talks about the various different methods that you can use to detect uh, communities, or they're also called modules, uh, hence modularity. Um, this is a great paper. Um, and as I mentioned, in the context of ecological networks, uh, particularly things like food webs, there are groups of species that tend to feed on similar sets of things that can be in some ways uh, isolated from other groups of species. Um, ecologists study communities because it's an inherent part of ecology. There, for a long time, ecologists have thought of their thoughts of communities as being made up of compartments of other things. Uh, and this idea of subsets of species of compartments that do different things within a larger ecosystem really goes back to the start uh, of ecology. So ecologists really jumped on this idea of community uh, detection. However, um, one issue uh, has been that most of the ecological networks are probably too small to really use these kinds uh, of methods. Uh, so um, it really reminds me of the Jurassic Park quote, uh, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think whether they should um, apply community technical <laughs> techniques uh, to uh, ecological networks. So there's a lot of work uh, involving ecological networks where researchers have sought to find these highly interesting subsets within their networks, uh, but whether they have found anything that's especially meaningful is still up for debate. It's not to say that there hasn't been some good work, but because the idea of compartments goes all the way back to the very first food webs, I showed, I showed you this figure yesterday. This is um, Elton's book, uh, Animal Ecology from 1927, but even the first food webs, he was highlighting, oh, there are compartments of things that tend to interact with one another more than others. So there is this uh, a priori expectation that you should find communities within a network. So there's no surprise that it even holds uh, today that you can organize uh, food webs, ecological communities uh, in different compartments of things. Uh, the probably modularity community protection methods were overused in uh, ecology. However, like I said, there was still a lot of really interesting work uh, involving finding communities in ecological networks. And I think most of the best work tended to relate the communities uh, that they found within their networks to uh, real ecological organizational ideas. So here was some really nice work by Resende uh, from 20, uh, 2009, where they searched for communities, uh, modules, compartments within a network, and then related what they found to the phylogenetic tree of 
uh, the community. So looking to see whether things that were genetically related to one another tended to have similar interaction patterns. And they indeed did find this, and this is for a marine system. Uh, this is in the Caribbean, uh, a food web. Uh, so this was a really nice example uh, of marrying some of the techniques that were coming out of complex networks more generally and applying them to ecological networks to identify uh, sort of meaningful ecological processes uh, and ways of structuring ecological networks. In addition to just the expectation that ecologists should find uh, compartments within their food webs, there was also a strong theoretical expectation uh, that compartments ought to be found. And uh, as usual, Robert May has a hand in this. So this is a paper from 1980 by Stuart Pym, who's a very famous ecologist, and also John Lawton. Are food webs divided into compartments? Uh, and in their second point, in the summary, uh, they say that, well, Robert May argued that in order for uh, food webs to be uh, stable, uh, local stability analysis, like we discussed yesterday, that food webs should be organized into blocks and compartments. That actually having these blocks was in some ways stabilizing. But like we said yesterday, it was, these were built on rather unrealistic assumptions. But nevertheless, there was also theory that was suggesting that modularity community detection should be a relevant mode of analysis for ecological networks. However, it took until relatively recently to collect the kind of empirical data that was needed to test such hypotheses. And although it's by no means uh, conclusive, under certain conditions of the certain systems, compartments or modules do seem to promote stability or persistence and one of those ideas that we've discussed uh, before. So here's a paper by Daniel Stauff and Jordan Vasponte from 2011, where they're really looking to understand, again, in the marine food web and um, just in terms of ease of data collection, um, marine food webs were the kind of ecological network that was studied initially. They looked to see after finding, using community detection techniques, uh, groups of highly interacting species, do these compartments have a positive or a negative effect on stability? And they did find that, well, stability and persistence, they did find that the more modular a network was, the greater the likelihood of the network being able to persist. Sort of a related approach that I like, and not just because I worked on it, involves what are called stochastic block models. So some of you might have come across this before. It's a general technique in mathematics and uh, computer science. These are probabilistic uh, models. So you first uh, specify probabilities of interactions between different groups of species, and you can assign species into different groups as you want, because ultimately you use likelihood-based methods to see how well your partition of species into different compartments or groups explains empirical data. So let's say you collect data on a food web, so you have all of the <laughs> interactions, and then you want to ask, okay, if I group these species together, and they have a certain probability of interacting with other species defined by the grouping, then does that grouping explain the empirical data well or not? So you can basically propose different kinds of models. Uh, so this very simplest model involving stochastic block models is a random graph. There is a single probability that any species interacts with any other species. And then I'll talk about these models in a bit, the cascade and niche models. Uh, where you have very particular patterns of interactions. Uh, you can even uh, redesign modularity uh, in terms of stochastic block models where you could have groups. Uh, so these colors here, three different groups where there is a much higher probability of species interacting within their same group and a lower probability outside of the group. Or you can have a group model where you have if you have three different groups, nine probabilities altogether for species interacting within their group and <laughs> every other group. Uh, so um, I think this is a really promising way of taking the idea of compartments in ecology and 
seeing how well different models, different groupings can explain empirical data. I think this is generally more usable with uh, the, the numbers of species and interactions that you find in ecological models, which tends to be much smaller uh, than you have with the traditional uh, networks, the community detection algorithms and of light. Any questions on that? People generally following along, yeah. Yeah, I just don't quite understand how this uh, black and white and also the, the surface out of the, the circle. Oh, okay, yeah. So to interpret this figure, uh, these are essentially adjacency matrices. So the rows and columns are species. Each time you have a filled in circle here, so a black circle, that is an interaction between two species, so this species eats this species, and then the different shadings on the slide of the different ways of partitioning species into groups or compartments. So if we look here, this is probably the one closest to what you'd be familiar with. Uh, you can clearly see that there are more interactions within the, the squares on the diagonal than there are outside. So this is showing you that this model is probably a good one for explaining why there are more interactions within um, a compartment or a group or a module, whatever you want to call it, compared to interactions uh, with species that belong outside of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. The basic idea is you can you get an empirical network, so represented by these black dots, and then you can propose various models based on how you group, and then you can use likelihood to compare how well the model where you infer what the probabilities of interaction are species within and between groups, and how well that explains the empirical data that you have, also based on a particular grouping of species. Like I mentioned before, and as I really emphasize in my undergraduate classes, the communities are really <clears throat> initially a researcher imposed phenomenon. Uh, I was, as was said in one of the questions, ecologists go out and collect data with a particular set of species and interactions in mind, and already they have subsetted um, a set of species for study outside of the, you know, within the larger ecosystem uh, and community of species uh, that are there. So once you apply community detection algorithms, you're really searching for subsets within subsets, potentially within subsets of something else, and ignoring interactions uh, to other things. So this idea of looking for subsets uh, within subsets uh, naturally leads to a lot of navel-gazing uh, among researchers. So here's a paper from the Journal of Vegetation Science uh, where uh, they're essentially asking about the existence of ecological communities uh, in the first place. Um, so even in the introduction, they kind of note that this is probably uh, uh, not a very good line of inquiry to go down. Uh, so here they write, the debate over existence of communities is an ontological and epistemological game, which is peripheral, uh, and someone else argued even harmful to scientific progress. We suggest that community ecologists define community operationally with as little conceptual baggage as possible so that we can put the debate about their existence behind us. Uh, so they wrote a paper basically arguing that you shouldn't write papers like this because they're probably not a good use of people's time. Um, so do, do ecological communities even exist in the first place? I think if you look at the, what's really remarkable, if you look at the uh, the first reference that's proposed, the Wilson 1991, uh, they go even further down the rabbit hole where the paper in the Journal of Vegetation Science is, does vegetation science exist in the first place? So those of you starting your PhDs, you know, be aware that you don't want to fall into this trap of questioning too strongly the whole purpose of what you're doing. Um, if you do, you wouldn't be the first. Uh, so, uh, researchers are forever trying to question whether what they're even doing is worthwhile or even uh, exists, uh, which, of course, I do all the time as well because I'm not immune from this. So do ecological networks exist? Uh, I actually think this is uh, a pretty simple question to answer, and it's no. Um, <laughs> and I think most people that I speak to, uh, I think they agree with me, no, they don't exist, but sometimes they're useful. Um, so sometimes networks can tell you something about how a real system is structured and is functioning, 
but it's um, it's a mathematical, it's an analytical approach to understanding a system. Ecological networks don't exist. They are researcher imposed phenomenon. They are help. They are like models, and you can have models of networks um, that they can be useful, but they don't exist uh, in a way that the system that you're studying exists. Any questions? Yeah, I was I was thinking about in biology is a very important self organization mm -hmm. and the uh, auto catalyst is uh, setting. And I heard only about the networks here, and network is happen there too. Mm -hmm. But that was for me is this the difference between these two disciplines. Yeah, I mean, I think my, so my <laughs> personal view, and I'll talk about this a bit more tomorrow, is I think networks are a tool. They're a way that you could, they're an, they're an additional way of analyzing a system that has benefits, it has costs, it's useful for some things, it's not useful for other things. So hopefully what you'll get out of this masterclass is an appreciation of the work that has been done and also when these methods are useful and when they might not, what you can really gain from applying them, but also their limitations as much as their benefits, because that's really important, particularly those of you starting out your uh, research careers, you will have to make decisions about not just what system you want to study, but how you want to study that system. And you will have supervisors, you have other people say, oh, these are the best approaches to use. And listen to them because they come through experience, but also think critically about the methods that you're asked to use and um, never just accept that this is a good method. Like I use ecological networks. I think they're good. I think they're interesting. I think they're useful for certain things, but I'm under no illusions that they really fail to explain a whole bunch of things. Um, so increasingly, as I begin to look at addressing sort of real world problems, I'm becoming more of a fan of a mixed methods approach where you basically acknowledge that <laughs> one line of inquiry will give you some information on a system, but having multiple lines of inquiry is usually better if you are going to inform decision making at some point. Um, so yeah, networks are useful, but they are not a hammer to be used with everything. Um, I don't think that really answers your question. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else people want to add to or comment on before I uh, move to discussing intervality? Well, I was uh, telling you this morning that this also yesterday, that this is basically also my perspective after working in networks for a long time, that networks do not exist. What does exist, however, are these dynamic networks. Uh, and it's, uh, you need some form of a time interval where you basically collapse the entire information into one's time temporal slice, and that produces a network. Whether that, uh, it's in some cases, it actually is useful to do that, but to what extent that is really um, uh, revealing a whole lot of information about the system processes, that is, that is uh, in my mind, a big question. Mm -hmm. So yeah. more and more I move into dynamic networks, that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. There's nothing else. Let's move on to intervality, which I don't know, there were some ecologists in the room, so maybe they're familiar with this concept. Um, yeah. Most of you wouldn't. Uh, and in order to introduce uh, intervality, I want to start by uh, returning to this slide and discussing in a bit more detail uh, some of the models of network structure uh, that were initially proposed. And as you'd expect, they uh, were pretty simple. So like I promised, this model here, known as the Cascade model, uh, was proposed by Cohen and Newman in 1985, <laughs> based on the very simple notion that uh, big things eat smaller things, that eat increasingly smaller things, and so on mm -hmm. down. Um, so this you can see here, we have um, predators and then their prey, and then you have the predator, the consumer that eats the most thing, it's probably the biggest, so it can eat all, everything that's smaller than it, then the next biggest thing eats everything that's smaller than that, so it eats everything except the thing that's bigger than it, and so on, so you get this pattern uh, emerging, um, 
And then this was extended uh, in the niche model uh, to consider species eating things that were smaller than it, but with more flexibility in terms of the range. But there was still the basic idea that big things eat smaller things. Uh, just in this case, there is a range of things that you consume, but you eat everything within your range. So these two models were united by the general idea that you can order species along a single trait dimension. Often this was body size. Big things eat smaller things. Uh, but of course, there could be other traits that you can have instead of big things eating smaller things. But the main idea was that you could organize species along a single dimension, and that explained their interaction patterns. And with both the cascade and at least the initial niche model, you ate everything that was smaller than you, or you ate everything within your range. And this is the idea that really motivates intervality. Uh, and it's basically premised on the notion that if you are so, if you are the biggest fish, why would you not eat something that was smaller than you? What would be the reason uh, for that? So mm -hmm. when we think about intervality, it really boils down to you have a single trait dimension you can order species. So if you look at this panel A, you have an ordering of, in this case, the prey um, along a single dimension. And then if you are the predators A, B, C, and D, you would eat everything within your range that you can eat. And maybe you don't eat things that are very small because they're not nutritious enough or there is some kind of competition that prevents you from eating it. But the things that you can eat, there would be no reason why you wouldn't. Um, so if you order species along a single dimension, then the theory would suggest that there are no gaps in what you eat, because what's the reason for not eating those things? At least if you think about these things from a very simplistic perspective. However, once you begin collecting real data, you suddenly realize that food webs are not perfectly interval. And by that, I mean there are gaps within the feeding ranges that you tend to see. So if you have a, an ordered set of species along a single dimension, you do see gaps where something will eat things that are big and then not things that are medium size and then things that are very small, for example. And you can measure intervality by given an ordering of species, essentially counting the number of gaps that you see in a food group. So how many things that are not being eaten that you expect to be eaten do you end up seeing? Now, one technical point is, of course, uh, you first have to have an order of species. And if you don't have a clear order, so body size isn't the thing that you want to order, you first have to order the species such that you minimize the number of gaps if you want to do a fair comparison between different food webs. Does that make sense, at least in terms of intervality? People kind of follow along the logic. The key idea is there is an ordering of species that you can have um, that defines interaction patterns. Theory suggests that you should have interval feeding, which means you have uh, feeding ranges with no gaps within the range for each species. However, empirical data, you do find gaps. So that leads to the question, how can you explain the emergence of those gaps? Why are food webs not perfectly interval? And then the obvious answer is there are other ecological phenomena besides that represented by the single dimension. It's not just body size that determines what things eat. So then you want to move, um, in theory at least, from considering one dimension to maybe including the effect of other dimensions. So this leads to the idea that was developed, um, I think, in the 1970s called boxicity. Uh, and this is the idea of intervality, but extended to higher dimensions. And formally, boxicity is the minimum dimension uh, that, in which a given graph can be represented as the intersection of axis parallel boxes. So what that means is if we consider moving beyond the one dimension, you have two dimensions, rather than no gaps along a line, you can encapsulate all of the feeding interactions by box. So you have two dimensions, you have boxes, you eat everything that falls within the box. So maybe it's uh, body size, 
and uh, temporal availability of your prey. Those are the two dimensions that determines what you can eat. So you have body size in one dimension, time on the second dimension, and you eat everything within your box. Uh, and therefore you should have no gaps in your box or boxes uh, should be, you should be able to draw boxes that can completely explain the interaction pattern, I guess, introduced by Fred Roberts in 1969. Um, and this is an extension of intervality to higher dimensions. So the interval graphs that we were discussing on the previous slide, they have a boxicity equal to one. And then as you move up higher dimensions, you have uh, a boxicity two for two dimensions, three for three dimensions. So this is a way of asking, given a particular ecological network, how many dimensions do you need to have in order to completely explain the pattern of interactions that you observe in an empirical network? So this is some work done by my colleague and friend, Anna Eklop, that really looked to answer this question. What is the dimensionality of most ecological networks? Or put in other words, how many trait dimensions do you need to describe a given network? Uh, and it's remarkably kind of small. So um, in general, she found that you needed less than 10 dimensions to perfectly explain the interaction patterns based on this idea of how many traits do you need to know in order to describe the system. And for most of the empirical networks that Anna studied, you only needed three or four dimensions. Now it's worth noting that these numbers three or four, they are theoretical numbers. You need three or four dimensions, but they don't necessarily correlate exactly with things that you can measure. So it's a bit like performing a principal component analysis where the dimensions might be a combination of other um, measurable traits that you can see in the field. Nevertheless, it speaks to, in some ways, the relative simplicity of most ecological networks that at least in theory, you can describe the interaction patterns of uh, communities up to a few hundred species using only a few dimensions. And if you allow some errors, some interactions that you can't explain using uh, this approach, then you can explain something like 90% of the interactions using only three or four dimensions. And if you try and relate those dimensions to empirically observable traits, uh, things like body size, um, immune response, uh, time, space, um, then three or four all dimensions is usually enough to get you most of the way to explaining real interaction patterns. So I think this is a really nice approach, but there's still the open question of why a certain number of dimensions? Why do we see that ecological networks require relatively few dimensions to explain? And then there's the additional question that you could ask of, well, how common are the important dimensions across different systems? And I think those are still open questions that are really interesting uh, to study, but will probably involve um, other theories, particularly evolutionary theories, to understand, well, why those dimensions, I think they're not going to be able to be explained using ecology only. Any questions on that? before I move on. Okay, I want to talk a bit about this concept of structural stability, uh, but before I get there, I want to have uh, a brief discussion between the difference between nominological and mechanistic models in ecology. So I don't know if you've met this uh, dichotomy before, but in ecology, it really boils down to, are you looking to model a pattern or a process. And, uh, more technically, you can think of uh, the nominological model as hypothesizing relationships between variables in a data set, almost in an abstract way, with those relationships seeking only to describe the data that you're presented with. And then by contrast with a mechanistic model, your starting point is really picking parameters that have clearly defined biological meaning and they are i guess biological definitions that can be measured or biological variables that can be measured independently of a particular data set so 
maybe it makes sense to look an example. So let's imagine we have this function here, um, f of x, so x is the variable, v and k are two parameters. If you're considering using this function in a phenomenological model and you want to measure population growth that has this kind of shape, which is the perfect kind of shape that this function uh, fits, then you can use this function to describe this set of empirical data. However, you can also use this function uh, in a mechanistic model if you believe that this V represents uh, predators attacking prey at a constant rate. Uh, so, uh, and then you have a handling time for the predator, how long it takes for uh, the predator to catch and then um, subdue its prey. If you think that these V and these K have some real biological meaning, then you can pick this function. It's the same function uh, used in both a phenomenological uh, and a mechanistic model. So clearly there's some sort of gray area interpretation about which is which because doing the same thing, it's really how are you choosing to use this function? So. It shouldn't be any surprise, even sure you've seen this before. Uh, this is Michaelis Menton, uh, and uh, it's called something different in ecology, the type two functional response, where this uh, describes the relationship between the number of prey consumed and the density of the predator population, so that's X. Uh, and these V and K supposedly have biological uh, meaning, uh, but I guess that's sort of a up for debate philosophical question. Um, but it's an important discussion that has preoccupied ecologists uh, for a while, not least because there's a long-standing preference for mechanistic models. So Ben Bolker, uh, in his uh, very popular book, Ecological Models and Data in R, he writes very near the beginning uh, of his book, all other things being equal, mechanistic models are more powerful since they tell you about the underlying processes driving patterns. They are more likely to work correctly when extrapolating beyond the observed conditions. But even as Ben writes in his book, there's still not a clear distinction between phenomenological and mechanistic models. Um, so even though there is an a priori inherent preference for mechanistic models, that's not to say phenomenological models aren't useful, nor does it mean that there is a clear cut distinction between the two different kinds of models. And I want to sort of see if I can take this general idea and apply it to consideration of ecological networks. And I want to start by uh, briefly introducing the Locker Volterra competition model. So, yesterday we met the Locker Volterra predator prey model. Uh, the competition model is very similar, but instead of predators and preys, you have two species uh, or two or more species competing uh, with one another. So, you might have here two big cats. Uh, they are competing for presumably similar resources because they're competing with one another. Uh, the presence of one negatively impacts uh, the presence of the other. Um, and uh, Letton and Salfa in a 2019 uh, paper sort of take this idea of uh, the competition model and they consider it uh, in the context of networks, and they write in their paper, we might assume these interactions arise via resource competitions, in this case, competition for water buffalo, but we don't know what resources they are competing for or how each species utilizes them. So with the competition model, all you're seeing in, or you're describing is this relationship here, how the presence of one species negatively impacts the growth rates of the other species, but it's in, but you never actually see the so-called real interaction in terms of, well, what are they actually competing? It's just presumed that there is this uh, positive uh, effect, the positive relationship of one of the, of the lion feeding on the water bottle. So this real ecology is sort of implied when considering a competition uh, network, um, which leads to um, the kind of remarkable conclusion, particularly from Daniel Stauffer, who is a really big name in ecological networks. He's a really great researcher, uh, where he writes, in a mechanistic competition model, 
all interactions are indirect, irrespective of whether a community comprises a single or a thousand consumers, which from my perspective, ironically, seems to throw into question the whole concept and value of ecological networks in the first place. Um, so what does it mean for all interactions to be indirect? I sort of introduced this idea of ecological networks as the edges, the links that you're drawing have some kind of relevance, some kind of meaning to the system. And then in this paper, Daniel sort of suggesting that, well, actually, maybe everything is indirect. Maybe these things don't really matter. I don't think it's as bad as that. And speaking to Daniel, I think the main point is with these, especially dynamical models based on networks, uh, or at least based on data that's collected in the field, these alpha coefficients, which describe the effect of one species on another, <laughs> really boils down to, well, they definitely describe effects, but to what extent can we say that the effect also describes some kind of real mechanism? So it's sort of a subtle point, uh, which is relevant when drawing your network, is those links, those edges that you're including in the network, what do they mean? Are we taking more of a phenomenological perspective on them? Are we just looking to generally quantify the effect of one thing on another thing? Or are we really rooted in, okay, this is a more of a mechanistic uh, interaction that we are looking at? So I think it's probably easiest to maybe ask uh, or see from considering a trophic interaction where you know there is something catching something else, something being eaten. There is a flow of energy or mass between two species. Maybe that's more of a mechanistic approach than say the competition model, which is how they set this up, where the competition, when you're drawing that link, that edge between the two species, it's more of an implied effect. And there are other mechanisms that are resulting in this competitive interaction. So it's kind of a subtle point that I think is nevertheless worth contemplating when drawing your ecological network, what is the meaning of the edge that you're drawing between the species? Having said that, if we go outside of ecological networks and we were to speak to uh, ecologists more generally, I think the thing that you would hear uh, most commonly said is that network models are phenomenological, which kind of uh, links back to you know, my previous big statement, which is ecological networks don't exist. So I think that's kind of how you can reconcile these two approaches uh, and also study networks, is they are in some ways phenomenological. There is a bias towards mechanistic models. This is sort of a sociological interpretation, um, but it's all counts within a massive gray area. Yeah, I was actually wondering. So, uh, in in the case of predator prey relations, the arrows very clearly, or the links, uh, they uh, they very clearly mean some sort of energy or nutrients for long transfer, as you pointed out. But if you think of competition, I would argue that they can mean something if you think of joint probabilities of the of the links to exist. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's like probability of a link to exist is is predator predator prey but when you think of competition then it's, it's a joint uh, yeah joint links uh, probabilities of having both links yeah i mean I, this is why it really everything really sits in this gray area because i where i think most ecologists would really like to live in a world of is I think this final statement here, which I think is a really powerful statement, which is parameters all have biological definitions that can be measured independently of a particular data set. And I would probably extend that, which is sort of a, a dangerous extension if we think about marrying models and data to the predictability of the combination of models and how you parameterize them. So if you have a model with parameters and you think it's a mechanistic model where you can go out and measure something to put into the model and make good predictions, that's a very high bar that I think few, if any, ecological models actually meet. Uh, and if you think back to the Lockerbot Terra predator prey model, if we assume, okay, predator prey, 
interactions are more mechanistic because they seem more satisfying to us as ecologists, and you look at the parameters there, you have things like handling time. What does that mean? So I can go out with my stopwatch and I watch a lion catch a gazelle and I see how long it takes to subdue it. Okay, I get a number. Can I then take that number, plug it into the model and make predictions about another comparable system and get good predictions? I'd be very surprised if that worked. But that's at least the baseline of what's going on. Um, I think my comment as well about most ecological or most network models are phenomenological also boils down to how simple they are in some ways, that they are inherently too simplistic to capture enough of a system for an ecologist to believe that they are mechanistic. And this also boils down to sort of the history of how ecology has been done and where it starts from with people studying relatively few species, but in lots of detail. You might even begin by studying one species and characterizing as much as you can about its life history. Um, each different stage of its existence and at the population level, how many eggs are laid, how long they take to incubate and move to, how long it takes for them to hatch, how long things stay in the juvenile stage, in the juvenile stage, what do they feed on? So an ecologist's standpoint is really detail, 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 and networks kind of take the opposite approach, is I want to generalize so much the, you're already starting from this, but it's phenomenological in some way. There's not enough there. Yeah, so so one way I like to make sense of this gray area between phenomenological and mechanistic models is to, there, there's this argument in theoretical ecology that, in principle, you can think of non couple terms as linearizations around an equilibrium point of a mechanistic model. So, mm -hmm. if, you, so if you imagine that you build up this kind of really maybe a detailed mechanistic ecological model and it goes to some kind of equilibrium state, you can always think of, okay, what would happen if I would perturb the density of one species out that affect the growth rate of another? If you measure that, say, linear sensitivity, then you can kind of interpret that as a lot of term model. So in principle, there is this connection, but it's actually a very local one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's a kind of valid, uh, like in the vicinity of an equilibrium point. And to what extent you can then extrapolate from there, that that's yeah, you know, some crazy play work in other cases, you know. So. Yeah, that's a great point. So I think mainly what I wanted to do was set up the dichotomy between phenomenological and mechanistic models, emphasize that really it's a gray area, uh, and to what extent it even matters is debatable. No one sits there and classifies things into phenomenological mechanistic until they do when you like send a paper off to review and mm -hmm. they say, oh, this is actually, this is not a mechanistic model, so therefore we don't like it. Um, so that is one of the considerations. Um, but also I think it's important to just understand in this sort of sociology of science context that you know, most ecologists think of network models as being phenomenological. In that respect, they inherently like them less than other models that are based on the history of the discipline considered more mechanistic. So that's just something worth bearing in mind. Uh, and given we've been going for an hour, it might be a good time to take a break now. So it should take five, 10 minutes, and then I'll finally get to the stability in a second. Uh, maybe you've had some time as well on this mechanistic versus phenomenological question. Um, and now we're going to get to what is structural stability in the first place. Um, so it's a general concept uh, from uh, mathematics, computer science. Uh, it was introduced to ecology by Rudolf Bohr in 2014, in which he writes, a system is considered to be structurally stable if any smooth change in the model itself, so this is a dynamical model like uh, one of the local Volterra models, or the value of its parameters, so some of the parameters in the model, if when you change the value of the parameters, the dynamical behavior doesn't change. Um, so that's the general definition of structural stability. To what extent can you change a model uh, and not have the, you know, the qualitative effect uh, to its dynamical behavior change. I think the easiest way of understanding this is to consider a two species competition system. So a bit like I put up there where you had the two big cats competing with uh, one another. So you set up your local Volterra uh, competition model. You can calculate the isoclines. 
Uh, so the isoclines are where the abundance of one species doesn't change for any set of parameters. In a two species system, you get two isoclines um, and then they have slightly different gradients and a system is, uh, well, the two species can coexist where the two isoclines cross. Does that make sense to people? Okay, so I think most of you yesterday were familiar with Loca Volterra. Two species, you have two isoclines, uh, where they cross or where the two species can in principle coexist with one another. And then you know, a system is only feasible if the two isoclines cross where both species have positive abundance. So in this panel A here, it's a feasible system because the two isoclines cross with positive abundance. In panels B and C, the isoclines cross where one uh, of the species has negative abundance. So that's clearly not a feasible system. You can't have negative number of uh, individuals of a certain species. So if you consider uh, A, B, and C, the feasible and non-feasible points, you can begin to draw out a space uh, a pra in within parameter space of the growth rates of species one and species two, and then you can draw in this parameter space the area with where you could have a feasible system. So everything that's shaded white in this uh, graph is where the two species can coexist with one another. So panel A here falls with this set of intrinsic growth rates in the lockable terra competition system. So one one, that's a feasible system. With these two non-feasible systems, they fall within this gray or green shaded area uh, where it's not feasible because where the two isoclines cross, you have negative uh, species abundance. People follow along with that. So the basic idea of structural stability is how large is this area within parameter space? So something slightly different from what we were talking about with Robert May and local stability analysis, which really asked, is a particular equilibrium point stable or not? Structural stability is asking how large is the parameter space that leads to feasible systems where all species in the system can coexist with one another. So, so put here, the larger the parameter space that's compatible with the stable coexistence of all species, the larger the domain of structural stability. So that's one way of measuring structural stability is how large is the area, or if you have more parameters, the volume in hyperspace that leads to uh, feasible systems with all species being able to coexist with one another. So you can look at this idea in a bit more detail, and this is how the authors study structural stability for systems with more than two species. Uh, with two species, it's trivial, you know, it's just this, the area of this uh, non-shaded area quantifies amount of structural stability. If you extend out to multiple species, your starting point is essentially the community matrix, which we met yesterday. I'm not going to go over it again, but the important thing to remember is that the community matrix is um, the Jacobian of the linearized Lockable Terra system evaluated at an equilibrium point. In more understandable terms, the community matrix describes the direct effect of average species J individual on species I's population growth. So it's the effect of each species on the growth rate of every other species in the system. So if we return back to the raw paper, they have a dynamical model uh, and they consider a mutualistic system, so they have plants and pollinators. Um, you don't need to understand everything that's in here, but it's essentially uh, a lockable Terra style equation where you have uh, the plants and the pollinators both benefiting from one another, and then you have competition between the plant species and competition between the pollinator species. So you have a set of couple differential equations between groups of plants and groups of pollinators. Like we did yesterday, you, you can linearize the system. There might be some kind of remapping, uh, but then you're going to evaluate at an equilibrium point, and you basically get this matrix B, which embeds all of the interaction strengths, all of the uh, interspecific effects, which is essentially the community matrix. Uh, so you can have a plant pollinator system following the steps 
that we took yesterday for local stability analysis. In some sense, you are then just studying in more detail the community matrix, but you're interested in understanding how the range of parameter values maps onto the community matrix, and then how that determines uh, the feasibility or the range of feasibility of the system. So looking at one of the figures uh, from their paper, you can think of structural stability as not just looking at the stability of an individual equilibrium point and its associated set of dynamical parameters, but looking at a, a particular empirical system of X number of species, in this case, uh, nine plants, 56 animals, and also a certain number of interactions, in this case, 103, um, and then looking to see what's the range of parameter values that are consistent with stability. And doing so once you impose particular constraints and combinations on network structure. So this is looking at the relationship between three sort of empirically relevant parameters, so the mean interaction strength, the mutualistic trade-off, uh, so that's the difference between the benefits or the trade-off between the benefits you get from interacting uh, with particular plants versus the amount of competition that you're facing uh, between uh, other pollinators and then this uh, nestedness, which if you haven't met, I'm going to talk about next, but you can think of it as being a summary statistic for the entire network. So structural stability you can measure as being um, a volume in hyperspace of the range of parameter values that lead to stability. And it's helpful to then look at cross sections of that hyper volume because it's a bit more informative. So for example, in panel B here, if you assume a particular value for the mean interaction strength, then the largest domain, the largest area of structural stability, so the largest amount of redness where that's higher structural stability, occurs when you have relatively high nestedness and relatively low mutualistic trade off. So, this is telling you for a particular community, if you want to um, maximize the largest volume of parameters that lead to stability, then you want to have uh, particularly nested networks or particular kind of network topology. And you also need the trade-off between mutualistic benefits and competition to be relatively low. And you can also look at it from another perspective uh, here in panel D, if you want to constrain nestedness to its empirically observed value, and then look at how much freedom you have in determining the other parameters, then you're going to get the largest volume of structural stability if you have a relatively high average interaction strength and still a relatively low mutualistic uh, trade-off. So in general, what I really like about structural stability is that it's a nice way of connecting the very theoretical concepts of May, which we went through some of the assumptions yesterday and said, well, it's not that realistic, but it's still sort of mathematically tractable and informative in some way. And structural stability sort of links those benefits of local stability analysis to some more realistic notions of ecological mechanism. So I think this is a really nice approach um, that comes from disciplines outside of ecology, but Rudolf Rohr and his colleagues were able to out structural stability in terms of ecological mechanisms. And it's a viable way of linking uh, local stability analysis with some of the ecological mechanisms that we might be interested in understanding the effects of them on the stability and feasibility real systems. Any questions? Okay, I really, if you, if you generally like the idea, I encourage you to read the paper and some subsequent papers that they've written on this idea of structural uh, stability. So I've just been talking about nestedness, and I sort of said, okay, like, either you've heard of it, or if you haven't, if you haven't, just bear with me. Uh, so what is it? Well, we've actually met this idea before. It's a relatively simple pattern uh, in predominantly bipartite networks. So if you have uh, some plants and a pollinator system, this is a nested pattern. Uh, it's essentially this staircase pattern in the incidence matrix. So if I haven't used that term before, the incidence matrix is essentially the adjacency matrix for bipartite 
So you have along the rows one particular group of organisms and on the columns another group. And then each of these shaded squares is an interaction. Nestedness is where you have this staircase pattern which describes um, the situation in which the most specialist insect interacts with the plants of the more generous species. So they're sort of nested a bit like Russian dolls, if you've seen that, where you have the most generalist um, insect visits one of these plants, the next most generalist insect visits a, a nested subset, so the same set of plants except a few, and then so on. So the more specialist you are, the more uh, the fewer interactions by definition, but you're interacting with the same plants that the more generalist species interact with. So you can contrast that with um, the uh, the modular networks where you have groups of highly interacting species that don't interact with other things. Um, in this case, the most specialist species interact with the interaction partners of the most generalist uh, species. Uh, and honestly, that's really all that really needs to be said about nestedness as a pattern, uh, but it brings up uh, a more general uh, interesting point that sort of uh, it's not quite as high level as the conceptual sort of cultural discussion that we had on you know, how science is done and what's valued as being shaped by a particular uh, scientific community, so the nomological versus mechanistic model. Uh, but there's a more technical manifestation of this idea of um, you know, the sociology of doing science that arises from the need to generalize findings from more uh, specific uh, studies. Uh, so this is an extract from a paper on nestedness in plant pollinator networks by my friend Fernando Valdivinos, uh, which I really like. Uh, and in the introduction, she talks about nestedness, uh, which I think is a really important point that it's a nearly ubiquitous property in empirical mutualistic systems. So we see nestedness, so that staircase pattern in a lot of mutualistic networks and plant pollinator networks. Then she gives a definition, maybe I should have just read this out, it makes more sense, in which specialist species with few partners tend to interact with subsets of the mutualistic partners of generalists. This is the important point. Different studies assert that nestedness either stabilizes or destabilizes mutualistic networks. So there's been this ongoing discussion in ecological networks whether this pattern nestedness is good or bad for the community. But the irony is we see it everywhere, but there's still this massive debate about whether it's stabilizing or not, whether it leads to robust, because robust communities or not robust communities, there's still no consensus about the link between nestedness as a structural property and the function of the network as I talked about in the previous lecture. Why is this the case? After you know, a few decades of studies involving nestedness in ecological networks, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of papers that are dealing with nestedness in ecological systems. Why is there still no consensus about the effect of this structural property on the function of ecological communities? And I think one of the reasons is the imprecise use of language by researchers, or to be more sympathetic, the limitations of language to convey subtle ideas quickly and succinctly. So here's my list of jargon that I went through yesterday, stability, robustness, resilience, uh, persistence. And if we take the general idea of stability, scientifically, we need to operationalize it. And that often means mathematically. And when that's the case, we consider either local stability, like we went through yesterday, or even global stability. So global stability being, well, if you perturb a system, it's going to move not necessarily back to its original state, but to another stable state. So there's lots of different ways of operationalizing uh, stability. If we just run and say, consider local stability, we pick that. And then we find that in our system, uh, we do have a locally stable equilibrium point. Then by definition, it's a dynamical system that's locally stable, then it must be robust by the way that we've defined it here, because if it returns back to its original state, which we assume is a good state, uh, then it must be a robust uh, community, a robust topological structure. 
And then if it's robust, then we must also presume that it's a resilient community. Uh, because if you return back to its original state that had a particular function, then presumably it's able to maintain its function. So therefore, we have a system that is stable, it's robust, it's resilient, and if it returns back to its original state, it's going to have the same number of species, so then it also yes. persists. Uh, so already uh, we have a confluence of these terms that you know, even after picking a very particularly way, particular way of analyzing stability, also follows the, the system is stable, it's also robust, it's resilient, it's also persistent. So it follows from our one study that it's not unreasonable to use all of these terms to describe that particular system. On the other hand, if we decide, okay, let's actually choose to study the persistence of a system. So we're really interested in whether following some kind of external perturbation, the community is able to maintain the same number of species after as before the perturbation, then uh, we first need to pick an approach uh, to studying persistence. And usually that's done through uh, dynamical models. But then once you decide, okay, okay, I'm going to use dynamical models, you have to decide, okay, what parameters am I going to include in my dynamical model? Am I going to consider linear or nonlinear relationships among my parameters, discrete or continuous time? These are all choices that I'm going to have to make in order to study persistence. This general idea needs to be made more specific by my choice of method, and then within the choice of method, all the additional decisions that you have to make. Am I going to consider a spatially explicit one? Am I going to add on additional layers uh, of complexity? Am I going to include the ability to, for species to disperse between, say, different habitat patches? <laughs> of course, all of these choices are going to influence your final result that you get. And in an individual paper, that's fine, because presumably the reader is going to look through everything that you've done and is <laughs> able to make sense and contextualize all of those decisions that have led to your final result, which you know, your starting point is is this community persistent? Is this community able to persist? And in the paper, you're going to have a yes or no answer or a maybe based on outlining all of these decisions that you've made. So the two points are really the methods that we choose to investigate relationships matters. Clearly, how you choose to address a problem is going to influence the results that you get. But then, like I started off saying, the words that we use when we generalize findings is also going to be an important consideration. You know, if we find something is stable, does that also mean it's robust? Does it also mean it's resilient? And we can think about the, you know, the association between these terms both in a technical sense, as we try to do with like local stability analysis on its own, and then in the final example I gave sort of in terms of studying uh, persistence, but then when you move from a specific case to specific findings and you want to generalize your findings and communicate them to other researchers, it's very easy to fall into the trap of moving between these terms in a general sense. So I tried to give you very specific definitions in addition to the specific definitions, you have your method of assessing, you know, for example, this relationship between structure and function. And then there's communicating your results, both within a single paper, but then also how it's going to be interpreted once you have people who are just reading, say, the titles of papers. So back to Fernanda's paper, and I really want to emphasize that I love Fernanda, and I think she does truly excellent work. But no one, even myself, is immune from the limitations of language. So I just want to highlight here that the title talks about network stability. But then when you look at one of the main figures presenting the results, technically, Fernanda is studying species persistence. So this is really highlighting this disconnect between or the limits of the language that we use to represent very specific definitions of what terms mean, the methods that you use to study a particular narrow area, and then how you're going to communicate your findings more generally. Um, so 
you both have the, you know, the equivalence of stability and persist persistence in general terms. Like if you went and you spoke to anyone, you can pretty much use those words interchangeably, but there's a spectrum of how these words are interpreted based on whether you're talking in general terms, in the very specific context of communities and that jargon slide that I put up, and then the methods that you choose to study a particular phenomenon. So this figure that I've been using both to illustrate bipartite networks and then uh, for nestedness actually comes from a short piece in Nature by Stefano Alessina introducing an article uh, in Nature that attempted to isolate the study of nestedness from how nestedness was studied. Now, if you've been following along with my arguments so far, uh, you probably think that's probably not really a possible idea, and I still think it's not really a possible idea. Nevertheless, uh, there was, um, this is the introductory paper, it's one of those like one page things at the beginning of Nature that introduces a larger paper later on in the journal. This is the paper where they try to disentangle nestedness from models of ecological complexity. So they really try to separate out the idea of nestedness from the methods that you use to study nestedness, which I've been arguing is probably not, it's just simply not possible. You can't disassociate uh, something like nestedness from the way that you approach the study of the phenomenon. So this is the article by James et al. came out in 2020 in Nature, uh, very quickly caused a lot of heckles by people who study nestedness. And my colleague and friend, um, Sergei Saavedra, wrote um, a dissenting paper addressing disentangling nestedness, the James et al. paper, called Disentangling Nestedness Disentangled, where they chose a different method to study nestedness and use that to show that the results are actually the opposite of what James showed. But this, to me, really boils down to the inability to separate out um, the method of studying a particular phenomenon from the phenomenon itself. So that way, the methods that you choose is just an intrinsic part of studying a system. So the, you've got to be really careful if you're trying to infer generalities uh, from results is number one, but also you have to choose a particular method and that shapes the results that you get. So if you really want to come up with general findings, you have to perform sort of a more critical synthesis of all of the work that has been done, the claims that they make and contextualizing the claims with reference to the methods that they used. So I think the big takeaway point is definite statements on their own are rarely helpful. Um, but nevertheless, it seems to be kind of a lucrative way of getting into high profile journals. Um, so that's something to bear in mind that also speaks to there are hot topics, um, but it's a shame when hot topics tend to be driven by, uh, I think, not necessarily relevant science where people forget um, that it's very hard to disassociate the methods, the decisions people take when analyzing phenomenon from a general interpretation of what the phenomenon, uh, how it can be described. Any questions about this? I think this is sort of a cautionary tale uh, for <laughs> applying network techniques and the limitations of language. Um, but I just want to get back to nestedness because I spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting concept. Uh, not least the history of it. So it really stems, and I think most ecologists don't recognize this, but nestedness, the idea actually comes from applied math, applied linear algebra in the 1980s, where nestedness are known as double nested graphs. So graph theory is uh, the study of networks by mathematicians. Complex networks are usually the term given to the same uh, formal mathematical structure by physicists and then increasingly uh, other folks. Uh, but you can kind of see here that it's, I think for most ecologists, double nested graphs, at least mathematically, are kind of impenetrable. Um, so from the initial study of double nested graphs, there was work done, I think maybe not knowing about the work uh, in uh, mathematics. Nestedness in ecology really stemmed from work on island biogeography, where instead of considering interaction uh, networks between species, you had um, islands 
further and further out from the mainland and asking, what species do you find on which islands? And is there a pattern in how you find species? And some work by Atmar and Patterson in the mid 80s showed that if you move from islands that are closer to the mainland, so the source of species, as you go subsequently further out, you get uh, subsets of the species that you find on the closer islands further out. And it's usually based on the amount of dispersal ability. So birds that are able to fly further distances, you can find on further islands, but they don't not, they are they're still able to be found on islands that are closer. You can also study this not necessarily on islands, but in fragmented habitats. So if you have a rainforest that's fragmented into fragments of different sizes, the larger fragments tend to house the most number of species. So here you have the largest fragment contains one, two, three, four, five species. Then as you move to smaller fragments, you find a subset of those species, maybe those that require fewer resources. Uh, so you tend to have uh, species closer to the bottom of a food web in the smaller habitats. Um, so then you move from the mathematical study of double nested graphs to this study of nestedness in island biogeography to, in the early 2000s, nestedness in interaction networks, where you had exactly the same formal pattern as in the map of island biogeography, but instead of just nodes connected to other nodes, and the presence of species on in different sized islands or fragments, you had interaction patterns between two different groupings of species. And the way that it's usually explained or the motivation for studying it comes from an evolutionary argument. You have, for example, if you take the case of hummingbirds here, hummingbirds with the largest beaks can feed on uh, the nectar from flowers with progressively deeper corona nets. So you have the largest beaks can feed on the most things. If you're a hummingbird that has a very small beak, you can only feed on the smallest of flowers. And this is an evolutionary process that has resulted in the size of hummingbirds' beaks and corona nets. And it naturally leads to this nested pattern. And this is, of course, a, um, assuming that there is no competitive exclusion taking place, but this is how one explains the general pattern of nestedness, at least from an evolutionary perspective. Recent work on nestedness has largely fallen into two camps. How do you measure it? So I've put up this sort of general uh, staircase pattern in the incidence matrix. Uh, but you very rarely see that pattern perfectly. So is there a way of getting a number between say zero and one that measures how nested a particular network is? And then the second uh, direction of work is explaining where nestedness comes from. So I've given an evolutionary argument, but people also want to understand an ecological argument. You know, Why do we see nested patterns on the shorter timescales involved with ecology? Uh, compared to evolution, which might set the backdrop for a nested pattern, but why do you see nestedness in ecological, uh, ecological timescales? People haven't been able to find a good ecological answer to that yet, and the current best explanation for why we see nestedness so commonly in ecology and indeed other systems is it's a natural result of having skewed degree distribution. So by that, I mean if you take all of the nodes in your network, you count the number of interactions each node has, that's the degree of the node, you plot the distribution of the degrees, the more skewed the degree distribution. So the more that you have some nodes with very large numbers of interactions, other nodes with very few interactions, the nestedness is the most parsimonious explanation uh, for, or for how those different degrees can connect together. So that gives you some kind of topological explanation for nestedness, that if you have a skewed degree distribution, a nested pattern is the one that you are most likely to come across. But that kind of puts the problem from why do we see nested patterns to why do we see skewed degree distributions? So this is sort of unsatisfying for most ecologists because it doesn't really explain why nestedness is seen so much based on some mechanistic ideas uh, in ecology. 
And the reason it's been difficult to study is largely due to the lack of highly time-resolved interaction data. Um, so fortunately, this kind of interaction data has recently become available, which allowed uh, myself and Deb to really address this question of whether nestedness could emerge from short-term ecological uh, processes. So there was a really great sort of compilation of temporal plant pollinator networks that was published in 2020 in Oikos. Uh, and we used some of this data to basically present the argument that nested patterns can emerge from a very simple process of when particular plant and pollinator species occur at the same time over um, a field season. So without having to uh, consider just the topology of the network, which you only know after you've collected all of the data, but we were able to link the emergence of nestedness to a very, very simple ecological process, just when species co-occur with one another. So I'm gonna talk about this more uh, tomorrow, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that nestedness is still an active area of study, despite all of the issues, or maybe because of all of the issues uh, about unresolved nature of the importance of nestedness. But the fact of the matter is, it's seen in a lot of ecological systems, and we're still trying to figure out exactly why we see it so often. So I'm going to end, as I promised at the beginning of the lecture, by talking a bit about how ecologists study this pathway between structure and function through uh, dynamics. And I'm going to use the example of weighted host parasitoid networks. Um, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but you, uh, you build these networks where you have some measure of uh, how often particular insect parasitoids infect other uh, insects, their hosts, by setting out traps in the field. The hosts, usually uh, wasps or flies, lay their eggs inside these traps, and these traps can be something as simple as peaches, you know, a food source where the flies lay their eggs inside. Then the parasitoid adults fly around, they see some host eggs or larvae in the traps, they don't know it's a trap, they lay their eggs inside the host, you bring your peaches into the lab, uh, you collect um, the host eggs and larvae out of the traps, you put them in test tubes, you give them food, you rear them, and then eventually you either have the host emerges or you have the parasitoid emerges, then you can identify what the host is and then what the parasitoid is, then you can begin building these networks where the width of the bars tells you how many successful parasitism events, how many parasitoids emerged, from a given collection of hosts. So you have some measure of the relative abundance of hosts and parasitoids, but collected only by focusing on those particular interactions that you've collected from the field. So that's host parasitoid systems and how you build uh, the weighted uh, bipartite networks. In terms of studying network dynamics empirically, it's very, very challenging to collect temporally explicit data. I mentioned before, uh, and with host parasitoid networks, you can't really do it in the same way that you can do with palm pollinator networks. You can't go into the field, collect insect pollinators landing on plants you know, on a daily basis, uh, which is how they collect the temporal palm pollinator data. So the main approach that ecologists use are essentially space for time substitutions. You go to a particular part of the world, in this case, uh, my colleague Jason Tillianakis has field sites in Ecuador, and instead of attempting to track, uh, to go through this process of setting out traps through time, uh, which is just simply infeasible given the amount of data that's required, you instead choose multiple different field sites of different land use types where you expect to find the same community, so the same set of species at different locations and different habitats. So Jason has field sites in rainforests, um, abandoned coffee agroforests, so where people used to grow coffee but then let it go so then the uh, the other plants, the other trees can regrow. Uh, coffee agroforest, where farmers have planted coffee uh, plants. So you still have relatively large amounts of tree foliage around. And there's some very open environments, so where there's very little forest cover. So rice, paddy fields, and then pasture. 
So Jason would go to Ecuador, he would lay out these crops in lots of different habitat types, and then you can essentially form uh, an environmental gradient where you're moving from uh, forest to abandoned coffee forest to coffee uh, plantations to rice and pasture systems. So it forms an environmental gradient of forest coverage, which mimics the effect of enhanced agricultural intensification. So you can imagine this gradient representing I have pristine forest, and if I were to convert it into various different agricultural uses, either coffee uh, plantations or rice plantations or rice fields, then you have um, this environmental gradient essentially mimicking a temporal change in land use. And it doesn't need to be completely different land uses. Uh, my colleague Valerie Coudrain has field sites in Switzerland where she samples host parasitoid communities from fragments of habitat at different levels of fragmentation. So these are outlining at different field sites uh, and they're in different uh, sizes of continuous, uh, in this case, a uh, European forest. So it's essentially using a space for time substitution. That is the primary way that ecologists have tried to study the effect of temporal change on a system, not by sampling through time explicitly, but by going, by taking multiple snapshots at the same point in time over some kind of environmental gradient. So what have we learned from this exercise? So analyzing recent Tilianarchus's uh, host parasitoid networks from uh, Ecuador, uh, you can sort of pull all of the different samples, in this case from forest to coffee agroforest, so where there is more forest cover, you get a network that looks something like this. And then if you pull all of the networks together, uh, all of the sampling data together in pasture and rice and more open environments and much less forest coverage, then you see there are distinct changes in network structure. Maybe it's not that clear for you because you don't study these uh, networks all the time, but there are two main things I want you to notice. That the interactions in pasture and rice become more specialized and focused. Uh, so by that, I mean you get these larger, stronger interactions, uh, or they are less evenly distributed among some of the species compared to in forest and copy agroforest. And the second thing, uh, I want you to notice is you get some interactions that I've highlighted in blue here that only exist in pasture and rice habitats, but not in forest and copy uh, agroforest. So uh, you can think that in pasture and rice, the parasitoids are targeting a smaller number of hosts within their potential diet breadth, or they're doing so, or they're focusing on fewer hosts. Uh, expending more energy targeting particular hosts, and they're also initiating some new interactions. However, one important or two important issues with this prior analysis uh, that has been done involving ecological networks is that it never accounted for the fact that species abundances change between different habitats. So this change in network structure could be a very simple passive effect of the fact that you have different relative numbers of species existing in one kind of habitat versus another. So if you have more or less of certain host species, then you might just get different widths of bars here in the middle, just as a passive result of the fact that you have different numbers of hosts to target. It's also important to recognize that these data aggregated over multiple different field sites, so they're not representative of any one individual field site. So there's something like on the order of 15 to 20 different field sites pulled here together. So this network, I said earlier on, networks don't exist. These networks really don't exist because they're not sampled even from one particular location, but multiple locations of a similar habitat type that aggregated together. So in order to really understand better how network structure might change as you move from one habitat to another kind of habitat, so still trying as a proxy for a temporal change in habitat use, we propose this idea of moving from interaction frequencies, which are all of the net networks I showed you previously, to studying what we call interaction preferences. So this is, we argue, a more ecologically relevant network because we're looking to understand whether the preference 
of parasitoids for their hosts changes or not between different kinds of habitats. So what we do is we break down the number of interactions between host I, parasitoid J, and field site K, which is what's shown in the interaction frequencies in one of those weighted networks before, into the product of the relative abundance of host I and parasitoid, parasitoid, parasitoid J at field site K, so the product of their abundances by this interaction preference matrix gamma, which tells you, does the interaction occur more or less frequently than you would expect based on the random encounter of the two species? So those of you that have studied introductory chemistry will notice that this is just equivalent to a mass action term. You have a certain density of hosts and parasitoids. And if you imagine their molecules of a, in a gas in a particular environment, they're moving around randomly, then they bump into one another. Uh, are they interacting in line with how often they randomly encounter one another? Or are they interacting more or less frequently than you would expect? They interact more frequently than you would expect that's a preferred interaction, less frequently than you would expect, that's a less preferred interaction. So this gamma matrix here, we argue is more ecologically relevant because it tells you something about the preference or not that some species have for their interaction partners relative to a baseline that accounts for the relative abundance of hosts and parasitoids. If you extend to other systems, the relative abundance of species in a particular location more generally. So to recap what we went through today, uh, we went through some uh, familiar topics, at least familiar to those of you that have studied complex networks before. So I discussed motifs and modularity in the context of ecological networks. I introduced to you the idea of intervality, structural stability and nestedness. I tried to raise some existential questions in the field involving communities or compartments. Um, and then some conceptual questions about phenomenological versus mechanistic models, and then I went on a big rant about the limitations of human language use in science. Uh, so that's it for today. Tomorrow, I'll attempt to speculate on some of the emerging directions in ecological networks. So that's it for the morning session. I'd like to thank you for listening, and then this afternoon we'll do a practical where we take uh, the idea of interaction preferences and you'll play around with it in R, similar to what we did yesterday. All right, thanks for your attention.